I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't it. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and uh, hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe Demar. Welcome to the Father's Day edition of For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology, we talk about the environment, talk about it in terms of how it affects you, your wealth, your health, your happiness. And happiness of your friends and your families and and your pets, uh, because ultimately all stories are tied back into the environment, into ec- ecological stories. We tell those stories here every week, and uh, for just an hour or so, sanity reigns here on a 106.5 The Ticket, and we would like your help this week, because this is the special Father's Day edition of for a green future this green year. Future. Good Father's Day show lined up for you. It's kind of a, a laid-back show, but we will be asking you to join us at 8.15. We're going to open up the phone lines because we want to hear your stories of your father and nature. That is, did your dad take you out fishing? Did he take you out camping? Did your dad introduce you to the wilderness or to uh, nature in any way? Tell us your stories about your father and uh, in terms of of ecology, in terms of the environment, in terms of exposing you to things like that. And uh, that'll be about 8.15 when we open up. And then, of course, we'll hear from our advertisers and give you some eco news, important environmental stuff that's going on. And then we'll have our letter from the future. Every week we get a letter from the year 2300. That's pretty much our show. Are you excited? So normally, you know, we do this show from the studios at 106.5 FM, which are, you know, very nice. And sometimes I like to get in a little early and do the ropes course out in the yard there because, uh, you know, just to get the blood pumping and think it flow into the brain. And when you do something like that, it just lets you know that you're doing something amazing, getting ready to, to do something great. We haven't been able to do this, Rebecca or I. Since the whole COVID thing, the studios are closed, and we're doing the show from our homes. To keep in the mood, I've been dressing up every Sunday morning, uh, getting in my suit or my tuxedo. And this week I am in a suit, but given that it's Father's Day I'm, and I'm taking it a little easy today, I uh, didn't wear a tie at all. No tie this week. So, uh, but luckily my sons are visiting. I have two great sons. One is in his mid-20s, the other's in his early 30s, and they're both staying with us uh, this Father's Day. It's been a, a great visit. And one thing I did with them the whole time growing up is introduce them to uh, camping, to nature. And that's one of the reasons I think they, they turned out as well as they did. Just a few things before we get to the, the Father's Day part of our Father's Day special. One is that uh, yesterday, you may or may not know, was the summer solstice. It was the longest day of the year. And it's typically 
marks the first day of summer, although it's been feeling like summer for quite a while here in, in northwest Ohio. It's been very hot and very dry. Uh, but we actually harvest had our first harvest yesterday in our garden. We, we were able to harvest some radishes. And uh, my wife loves radishes, and these turned out just beautifully. They, they're just, you know, red and round, and they look as good or better than any radishes you'd get at the she grocery get store. So that really feels good, to be able to actually harvest on summer solstice. Usually we don't even get the garden in until summer solstice, so so uh, this is a, a banner year for our household. How about you? Are you guys doing any gardening out there at our, in Radio Land? Have you got plants in yet? Have you got... Have you been able to harvest yet? We've got some promising looking tomatoes on the vine already. The zucchini, I've been actually pollinating the zucchini flowers myself to make sure they get pollinated, but, but, uh, it's looking like a pretty good year for gardening. And I, I wanted to hear your stories of your father and nature. Did your dad take you camping? Did he introduce you to maybe hunting or fishing or any of those, those outdoor activities? I know my father, that he was a, uh, he was actually the father of seven. <laughs> we had a really big family, but he did take time to, he was also a scoutmaster, so he took my brothers and me out camping quite frequently. And, you know, when you're out camping, when you're really out in the woods, sleeping in your tent, you, you learn a lot of things about the environment and about yourself you learn, for one thing, that there are real boundaries. <laughs> you know, we've got all these societal boundaries around us. Uh, but when you're out camping, you, you learn, okay, what is it, an actual real boundary in terms of, for example, like we don't run around yelling and screaming most of the time. But if you're out with a, if you're out camping with a, a troop of Boy Scouts, there's a fair bit of running around and yelling and screaming, and and it doesn't hurt anything. And usually the the scoutmasters will just sit there and tolerate it. But you start running towards the top of a cliff, <laughs> and they step in and they say, you know, get away from that cliff. It seems like a very not a very common sense sort of thing, but it's a real thing. You know, you learn that okay, this rule over here is something we all sort of do because we've agreed to do it, but that rule over there, you have to do that or else you'll suffer the consequences. And things, you know, that sort of extends to things like poison ivy, for example. I mean, you, you don't ignore the the person, and often it's the father, telling you not to touch that poison ivy because you, if you're in a scout troop, you see, you see the, the scouts who did ignore it or you see the scouts who didn't realize they were in a patch of poison ivy and you see that the terrible consequences of that. Um, and it, it's really, it really helps shape your character to be out in nature, to actually see those things and, and feel the, the actual, um, real limits and real bounds. And also, if you're lucky enough to have a father who can introduce you to the, the better the more pleasant, the sustaining parts of nature. You know, one of the things we did when my father was a scoutmaster and we all went camping was we would go foraging and we would make a a wild stew. We would get out there and we'd find mushrooms, we'd find leeks, we'd find uh, edible wild plants, and we would make this delicious stew. It was just amazing that, you know, you'd just patch a forest you know, with a, so maybe a field next to it, and you'd go walking around in about an hour or so, you could pick enough wild plants and, and wild resources to actually make a stew that would feed everybody. And that was just an eye-opener for me. That was just like, wow, nature really does provide. It's really kind of a, an intense experience. Have you had an experience like that at Give us a call at 866-240-1065. Did you ever like go out with your father? And one thing my father did with us a lot was fishing. And so, you know, when we would go out to the river, we especially when we were living down in western New York in Elmira, we used to go fishing in the Shemung River, which is a really nice little river. It does have a tendency to flood. 
But, you know, you pull a big fish out of the river, and it's a, it's a kind of a thrill. You bring it home, and we would actually go fishing for supper sometimes. Like I said, there were, <laughs> there were seven of us, and we ate a lot of seven of us kids, nine in the family. And so a day where we could go down and, like on a Saturday, spend the afternoon fishing and come home with enough fish for us actually to eat for dinner, that was just sort of amazing, and it really helped with the, the family finances, too. Did your dad do anything like that? 866-240-1065. In fact, I think what we're going to do here, uh, Russell, I think what we're going to offer a, a nice little gift to the first caller, to the first person who calls in. You call in, you talk to Russell, give him your name and address. You do have to come on the air. We will talk to you a little bit about this. You also, for any other rules about this, you go look at the, the 106.5 WTOD website. But uh, give us a call at 866-240-1065. Share with us uh, a story of your father and nature. We were, re- we're really looking forward to it. Yeah, you also kind of learn when you're out in nature, in the woods, hopefully with a, a father or, or father figure maybe. Maybe it's not your biological father, but maybe somebody who took you out and showed you sort of things in the wilderness, you learn what's what's really essential. I, I call it the water versus donuts uh, lesson. I remember that our scout troop, we went one year on a hiking trip through the Adirondack Mountains, and it was a seven-day long trip. It really kind of helped shape me. I was 12 years old at the time, and, and just the the intense experience of, of hiking all day and having to make your own camp. And one of the essential lessons I learned on that trip was uh, just how essential water is. Because when we went, we were using an old guidebook, and our scoutmaster was counting on a spring. This is about day three. Uh, the old guidebook said that there was a spring at this one spot, to, and we were all counting on that to be able to fill up our canteens because there was literally no water all that day. We, had, we hadn't filled the canteens the day before, no place to do it. We had to hike all day with no water, and it was a hot summer day, even up in the Adirondack Mountains. We get to this place where there was no spring, and we were stuck. <laughs> we still had to have water because, you know, we had a scout troop of 30 boys, and we were all dehydrating after walking all day and not not sparing, not... We didn't husband our water because we were all expecting to be able to refill our canteens. And so what we ended up doing is the place where the spring was was all uh, grown over with moss. And so what we actually did was got, a, got out our little camp shovels and we dug down through that moss until we, we came to this muddy brown <laughs> uh, water that was underneath it. We dug down, and what we ended up doing is three of us who had clean T-shirts, we ended up taking this brown, mucky water, and we filtered it through three T-shirts, and then we added chlorine tablets to it, and we all managed to get enough to just wet our whistle. We all managed to get enough water that we weren't that we were able to sleep. And uh, the next day, we were, we actually made it out to a lake where we were able to to get lots of water, but uh, that taught me, you know, just how essential water is. And if you really need it, you're going to do whatever it takes to get it. And I say that water versus donuts. We weren't thinking about donuts. We weren't thinking about the, the kinds of, of luxuries we have all the time. We were we were in the nature and we had a very basic need and we had to meet it. And we did whatever we had to to do that. And that was an important lesson for me as a 12-year-old. Carrie, welcome to For a Green Future. Hello, how are you? I'm well. How are you doing? I'm, I'm okay. I uh, wanted okay. uh, to. So my father was. Um, he was a busy, busy man. He had like you know, eight kids to support. And uh, eight. But wow. Okay. What he support? What, what he taught me was um, conservation of, of resources. That was. Uh, he became a adult through the depression and the thirties and um all my life has stuck with me so um 
it was before you know, recycling and all that stuff when I was coming up. I'm in my late 60s, but it was uh, about making the best use of everything and never discarding anything that can be used for something else. And so it's kind of a natural transition for me to become an environmentalist and environmental, you know, advocate. Um, so that's my, my story. Oh, that's great. That's that's a great story. So could, could you give us an example of the, the kinds of things that, that your dad might conserve that somebody else would might just toss, somebody who didn't have that? Well, it was about habit. everything. It was about the care of your um, belongings, your um, even, you know, as far as personal, like, shoes. And so this day I polish my shoes, and they last me years, and um, it's mm-hmm. uh, obviously tires um, on the vehicles and um, not wasting water, even though we're surrounded by these big lakes and not be, you know, and, um, you know, like a lot of people just take for granted, like, bless, electricity is cheap, and we would always, you know, we left the house, all the lights were off and everything was, you know, just that kind of like, common sense stuff. Yeah. Well, that's great. Those are those are important lessons. So it sounds like he might have been too busy to take you out into the woods, but did you get exposed to nature on your own or through organizations? Or well, actually, the neighbor uh, had um, gentlemen, neighbor gentlemen, my best friend's father took uh, me and my, my little brother out. Um, Taught us how to like set, make sassafras tea, and how to oh, uh, yeah. recognize trees and plants and all that kind of thing, and wild beer and birds, and taught us about nature. He was a person who worked in the conservation corps and was a firefighter, and he had a real love of nature and that kind of side of it, and so he kind of filled in the missing parts. Oh, that's great! Yeah, I, I remember the first time I tasted sassafras I, you know it was I was out hiking with somebody who was this wasn't my father but like you it was someone who had a, a good uh, grasp of, of nature and it, you know he just said here take this he just p- plucked a, a sassafras leaf off and told me to chew it like gum and I was like wow that was delicious I, I was just amazed <laughs> that you could just pull a leaf off and <laughs> it would taste so good Right, it was, so there's, this this gentleman actually spent his whole rest of his life as a tree surgeon, so he also conserved, you know, trees and helped them, you know, stay healthy and, you know, preserved them when they could be preserved and all, but, so it was pretty, I had pretty well-rounded education in environmental and in conservation of resources, and it was served me well my whole life so all right well thank you carrie thanks very much mm-hmm. and happy father's day thank you bye okay all right that was carrie you could join us too at 866-240-1065 think of it as a chance to memorialize your father i mean most of us listening never met your father uh, you don't know what kind of a, a legacy he left, don't know what he taught you. Um, here's a chance to get on the radio and, and have thousands of people all around Ohio, actually, since we're rebroadcast in Columbus. Have them learn a little bit about your dad, you know, memorialize your father, or assuming he's still with us, you know, give a little bit of praise and a little bit of credit to your dad in terms of, did he help you understand a little bit about the natural world around you? Uh, yeah, give us a call at 866-240-1065. This is the best show in Ohio, but it does get better every time you call. Okay, well, that was a nice call from Carrie. And uh, I think it's time for us to hear from our nice sponsors. Yes, For a Green Future is brought to you by the Wood County Park District. Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. 
They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. And there's a whole bunch of ways you can follow what the Wood County Park District is doing. You could give them a call if you want at 419-353-1897. That's 419-353-1897. You can also check out their website at wcparks.org. And uh, you can download their app. Just go to the App Store and search for WC Parks. And, of course, they're very active on Facebook, as so many people seem to be these days. Just go to the Facebook and search for WC Parks. Okay, and our show is also brought to you by our fantastic sponsors. Our sponsors uh, went to Patreon.com, and they searched for For a Green Future, and there they discovered that for just a very tiny, painless monthly charge to their checking accounts, they could help support our program and keep us on the air. We're very grateful to our sponsors. We literally couldn't be doing the show without them. You know, if you'd like to follow their example, just go to patreon.com and search for For a Green Future. Okay, now we are on to the part of the show where we talk about news and information. But still, don't hesitate to call. If you've got that story about your dad, that one story that really sort of sums up your dad that has to do with nature or the outdoors, uh, give us a call at 866-240-1065. We will gladly stop at any time and uh, get you on the air. And uh, this is a good week to call about your dad because uh, the environmental news this week is a little bit... Uh, a little bit down. It's a little bit of a, not a great week for the environment this uh, this week of the sol- of summer solstice. One is a, a new threat to the environment that uh, I just learned about this past week, but apparently it's been around threatening us since 2014, and that is when the first spotted lanternfly appeared in Pennsylvania. Uh, and the spotted lanternfly is a uh, an insect, it's a pest, it's an invasive species, it, it's native to China and India and Vietnam, and it eats most everything. Uh, it, it feeds on uh, fruit trees, ornamental trees, woody trees, uh, it even eats tree of heaven, which is a tree that can withstand almost any other sort of thing you throw at it, uh, but it, it can eat our hardwoods, it could eat our softwoods, it could eat the grapevines. And what the way the spotted lanternfly operates is that it's got a very long piercing mouth parts and it it basically pokes holes through the bark and sucks out the sap. And uh, sucking out the sap, uh, they releases honeydew that drops on the ground around the trees and the bushes and the shrubs. And it, that causes a big, ugly black uh, spotted mold to grow, grow around the tree and they could literally wipe out entire forests <laughs> and I had not heard of them before the problem with the spotted the spotted lantern fly infestation is that they are following exactly the same protocols they did when the uh, when the emerald ash borer showed up that is they're just like watching it and and then if it's a, there's a lot of them in a specific county, they, they quarantine the county. That is, they put up lots of signs and bumper stickers saying, don't carry wood out of the county. Uh, and this is an utterly ridiculous, this is an utterly failed strategy for controlling an invasive pest like the spider lanternfly or the emerald ash borer. I mean, ash trees have just about been eliminated from the state of Ohio because the emerald ash borer showed up in Michigan. Same thing's happening with this spotted lantern fly, and, and we're going to be doing more uh, show, another show on this in the future. But it has not yet reached Ohio. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that it has spread uh, north and south from the state of Pennsylvania into the adjoining states. So it's still in the earliest enough stage that it could conceivably be stopped 
and it ba- definitely back in 2014 when it first appeared and was just in one county, that was the point at which, like I say, normally I don't advocate using pesticides, but when you've got a brand new invasive species with so much destructive potential, uh, that's the one time where I say, okay, go in and, and, and spray because now it's ex- going to be extremely difficult to contain it. And the, the responsibility for protecting Ohio from it has fallen on the Ohio Department of Agriculture. Basically, right now, they've just got a, a watch and see attitude, which you can't take with a with an invasive species like that. Because all you do is watching them destroy the environment, watching them to d- destroy the resources that we've got. So um, we need to get more active about this. We There has to be a... a program to eliminate the spotted lanternfly now while it's still possible because as i said it can it has the potential to destroy our fruit industry by wiping out our fruit trees uh wine industry because it destroys grape vines uh not to mention timber industry because it destroys oaks and maples and all kinds of valuable hardwoods and not to mention just completely destroying the ecosystems, the wild, you know, not even the dollar sign. So just learned about the spotted lanternfly. And once again, here's a case where it most likely came in on a pallet from China or some other piece of wood. And the person or the company that shipped that pallet is not responsible for the billions and billions of dollars of damage this insect pest is going to going to do. And whatever economic event allowed this to happen, whatever sale of, I don't know, plastic toys that ha- that had this pallet, infested pallet, come into the United States, the, the losses we all are going to suffer outweigh that tiny little bit of economic activity by such a great amount that in a sane world, it would not have happened. In a sane world, every import would face quarantining, would face procedures like heating up the pallet that would actually kill pests like the spotted lanternfly because that's more important than making that one sale of a, of a few dollars uh, and risking the billions of dollars that our ecosystems provide us and benefit. But we're in an insane situation right now, although we did get a little taste of sanity here with the COVID virus because... Some countries, like New Zealand, for example, are actually finally instituting two-week quarantines for anybody who visits. You know, they're they're finally recognizing the biological reality that just allowing all this commerce and all these all this travel unfettered and, and without any regards to biology and things like diseases is crazy. And so now, if you go to New Zealand, you've got a two-week quarantine period then you get to enjoy New Zealand I mean it's just something you need to do if you're going to a new continent or a new island or anywhere new that that should happen it's time we put biological reality into our economy and speaking of ignoring biological reality uh, the latest terrible thing that the Trump administration is doing and you know it's interesting I do this show once a week and like clockwork, the Trump administration does some outrageous anti-environmental thing that actually hurts people. And so every week I've got something to report that the Trump administration is doing to hurt you and your family. And this one is very direct. This one is like, bam. And essentially what the Trump administration is doing said it is not going to regulate a, a chemical called perchlorate. And perchlorate is something, it's a chemical that's made as a byproduct of generating things like rocket fuel, also some fertilizers. And what perchlorate does when it gets into the water is it, it interferes with the function of the, the thyroid gland. And if you're, let's say, a developing fetus or, you know, a baby who's being breastfed, by someone who drinks water, that 
interference with the thyroid gland will actually damage your brain. It'll act if you're, especially if you're a developing child, it will lower your IQ. It'll cause you developmental dis, developmental difficulties. It's literally poisoning our children. So that, so the Trump administration, what had happened is that the Obama administration had started regulating it because the number of communities per chlorate contamination is a measurable problem and it was causing uh, lower IQs, it was causing brain damage to children. So the Obama administration started regulating it. Uh, this past week, the EPA, under the heading of Andrew Wheeler, who was the pro-industry anti-environmental lobbyist that Trump appointed to the head of the EPA, he announced that the EPA is not going to regulate perchlorate. And so essentially, this is just Trump poisoning you and your family. I mean, this is the Father's Day edition. And, and so fathers, you know, if you've got children, if you've got young children, if you have a pregnant wife, if you have, if you're hoping to have children someday, Trump is trying to put poisons into the environment that will hurt your children. And they make some sort of, they made some sort of lame, extremely lame argument about this. They're saying that some states have already regulated it and are treating for it, so the federal government doesn't have to do anything. That is just insane, and we, we see this insanity because the states that aren't regulating it and the states that aren't treating for it, their citizens are just as vulnerable as the ones that are. And the federal government is the one that has the responsibility to protect the whole country, not just a few states and a few places where maybe there's a wealthy community that can afford upgrading their water treatment system to handle perchlorate. Uh, it needs to be done nationally. The people in a poorer state have just as much right to clean drinking water as people in a wealthier state with uh, better pollution laws. And th that's the job of the federal government, but not in the view of Andrew Wheeler and Donald Trump and the Trump administration. Uh, there was a story on this back in New York Times on June 18th, and there was a line in there that I, I really want to repeat because the New York Times got this completely wrong. They got this terribly, terribly wrong. The line is, the quote is that that the Trump administration overturned the underlying scientific findings in justifying uh, not eliminating the regulations on, on perchlorate. No, the Trump administration cannot overturn scientific findings. <laughs> That's like saying, you know, that that Trump administration overturned gravity. The science remains the same. The science stays untouched. Perchlorate damages infant brains and damages the brains of developing fetuses, D damages children in the womb and out of the womb. That can't be overturned by the Trump administration or by Andrew Wheeler or by any human being. Uh, this idea that we can legislate away reality is uh, its mentally ill. It's, it's sick. And I, I was kind of surprised to see that the New York Times sort of kind of gave a green light to that, sort of said that, that that's what had happened. It's, it's wrong. And also, it's not only wrong, it's also illegal because this is part of what had happened is there was a court case brought because the, the EPA under Wheeler already wasn't enforcing this, this rule made by the Trump, by the Obama administration. And there was a court order that said, you know, by June 30th, they had to start regulating perchlorate. And so this is direct defiance of a court order also. So it's the administrative branch defying the judicial branch. So it's not only under, undermining the, the environmental protections for, for those of us living in the United States of America. It's also undermining our government itself that, that 
the Trump administration and Andrew Wheeler are willing to defy law in order to allow this pollution to, to get in and hurt hurt us. Uh, it's just it's just it's just amazing. <sighs> I want to follow that that really intense negative stuff with a, a nice positive story, and uh, it is a very encouraging story. And that is that uh, the statistics for the Southwest Power Pool have come out, and this I got this off of a website renewablesnow.com. And what happened, it was a a day to remember, it was a day to mark April 27th of this year, and that is because for there was an hour on April 27th where wind power alone, you know, not wind and solar, just wind power, produced 72% of the power used by the entire Southwest Power Pool which is the the grid operator that does the central section of the country. So just wind by itself was was give, putting 72% of the power into the grid. And I remember the people in the natural gas industry, the people in the nuclear industry, in the coal industry, uh, not long ago, just a few years ago, were saying that the maximum saturation you could have with wind and or solar is only about 10%, that, that above 10% and the, the grid will collapse, that it's just so uh, intermittent and unreliable and variable that you just literally couldn't have more than 10% come from wind and solar. And it's very clear they were lying. <laughs> they were lying to save their industries. They were lying to so that they could keep their jobs and keep putting more and more carbon in the air, which, of course, is... a a terrible thing that hurts everyone, but they were lying in order to save their industries. And over and over again, it's being proved that they were lying, and they're still lying, because they're, they're, you will still hear those statements like that, that you've got to have base power, that wind and sun are too variable. No, as long as you are smart about it, as long as you have the ability to to ship power around where it's from where it's being generated to where it's needed, as long as you have a, a somewhat flexible and smart grid, you can put all the power from the wind and the solar on. And as we saw on April uh, April 17th or April 27th, excuse me, we were able to power 72% of the central part of the United States of America just on wind power. And that was a that was a one hour record. Uh, a little bit earlier on March 7th, there was actually a daily record. That day, March March seventh, the uh, wind power alone provided 62 percent of the power used in the central part of the United States of America, just on wind power. So they said it couldn't be done. It obviously can be done, and we know it could be done because every week we get a letter from my great great granddaughter Marie I, who's living in the year 2300. There's a flash of photons next to my bed, and poof, there's this letter from from Marie I. So, and she tells us all about life in that green future where where we have figured all this out, and we're using wind and solar and and geothermal power, and and we've reversed the global warming, and everything is, uh, environmentally speaking, everything's pretty good. So here's this week's letter. Dear GGG, Happy Father's Day. My father, your great-grandson, is thankfully still alive, and we spent it together. It was on June 16th this year, and my dad helped me get ready for my upcoming hike of the Slippery Elm Trail. As I told you before, that trail now goes all the way from Toledo to Cincinnati, with 100 feet of protected wilderness on either side. I've decided to walk the entire length as part of my recovery from radiation poisoning. So we spent the day pulling out my old camping gear and hiking gear down from the attic, arranging provisions, working out with my brother Sam a schedule for sending me food and provisions via drone, etc. Dad started the walk with me that day. The first campsite is about a mile and a quarter south of where I got on the trail near our house in Bowling Green. It was all I could do to make it that far. After about a mile, I was leaning so heavily on Dad... He practically carried me the last quarter mile. 
He is the only, he is the one who actually set up my tent and cooked dinner over the campfire. We ate dinner and talked until the fireflies came out. Then he headed home. I went straight to my sleeping bag because I was exhausted. Then at about 11.30, I got woken up by a piercing whistle blast. I had forgotten that there is, at night, a holographic recreation of the trolley system that ran between Toledo and Cincinnati. Someone had the bright idea of making it follow the actual schedule from those days. So I stuck my head out of the tent just in time to see the ghost train whiz by at 50 miles an hour. I spent the next day just resting up from the previous day's hike and enjoying watching the birds and insects buzzing around the camp. But I've started up again and have actually walked all the way to just south of Rudolph. I will keep you updated on the march. Love, Marie I. So that is a hopeful letter that uh, there's opportunities to still camp and hike in the year 2300. One thing I want to do is, is press upon people that the, the need for all of us to work together to get to that kind of, of a green future. Um, unfortunately, we're not doing it yet. And uh, there was another bit of news that I wanted to share with you. Uh, right now, they're having a heat wave in Siberia. And for the first time ever, yesterday, Saturday, this past Saturday, they had 100 degrees Fahrenheit in Saturday, or on Saturday. And that is more than, than 35 degrees above normal for this time of the year. And unfortunately, what's happening is that these, this heat, this heating, this global warming is following exactly the pattern that was predicted by all the, the models 20 and 30 years ago. What's happening is the poles are warming much, much more quickly than us. I mean, we've had some hot, dry days here for the past week or so. I, we had to get out and water the garden. But the poles, the northernmost parts of the world, the, the up there in Siberia and, and Alaska and the places, you know, in, in the upper territories, the northern territories in Canada, the places that are the coldest, supposed to be the coldest in the world, they are heating the fastest. And so we are feeling some effects of global warming, but they are having a radical turnaround. There's no question, nobody in Siberia is doubting that there's global warming. For one thing, they're having another round of fires up there. And last year, as you recall, was a year of fire in the north. And it, you'll also recall that we've talked in the past about how what happens this time of the year, what's supposed to happen is that the trees and the leaves and the plants of the northern hemisphere start photosynthesizing, and so they pull carbon out of the air. And so every year at this time, the carbon rates go down. The carbon levels in the atmosphere go down. Well, one thing I didn't tell you is that the majority of this uh, photosynthesis, and so where the most carbon gets pulled out of is the great Tiaga, the great forest that goes around the, the, the pole in the northern parts of the continents. That Tiaga, that, that those evergreen trees that are up in the cold, cold area that grow like over permafrost and things like that, that that's what does the most of the work of pulling out carbon. And right now, those places are burning. <laughs> Those places are catching fire, and so they're becoming carbon producers rather than carbon sinks. And this is part of what's been going on. It's I've talked about this before, the positive feedback loop, the idea that the more carbon you put in, the more carbon gets released, and that accelerates global warming even more. And we're caught in this loop, and we have to stop it. And so things like the, the airline industry can't go back to the way they were pre-COVID. And we really can't go back to burning as much fossil, as much or more fossil fuels than we did before this great COVID pause that we had. We've got to keep it down. And so, so the government is failing us. I mean, the government policies are more carbon, whatever it takes, put more carbon in the air. And, so it's up to us right now 
to do as much as we can as individuals. And so, you know, that's why we're putting solar panels on the house. And that project is, is hopefully going to actually break ground this coming week, knock on wood. We've been preparing for this for years, for decades, and we've actually had the panels in our garage for some weeks now. And our sons, one of the things they did on this visit was help us clean out the garage <laughs> so that the workmen can get in there to install the solar panels, which is, I'm just, we're just, Carol and I are just incredibly great for that help. But everybody needs to be doing that. If you could afford to put solar panels on your house, put them. And one thing that we're going to be having with our solar panels, it's a brand new thing. I've mentioned it before. Our hybrid electric car, there's going to be a car charger attached to the inverter that puts the power into the grid. And so that means our panels will charge up our car first. And then if there's leftover power, then it will put it into the grid. And so we're going to be using the sun both for powering our house and for our transportation because we know that it's not just electricity. It's transportation. It's agriculture. It, it, everything that we do, it's industry. Everything that we do has to become carbon-free and it has to do it very, very quickly. Okay, we are racing along. Still time for one call. You know, th let's let's hear that story about your dad that it would be good for everybody to know. You know, something cool your dad did with you in regards to environment or ecology. 866-240-1065. It's, it's a shame uh, Rebecca wasn't able to stay on the line because I know that she had a very close relationship with her dad in, in those terms. What a little interesting note. Uh, some of you may remember uh, Heidi Hutner. We had her on as a guest uh, about oh six months ago because she's making a movie about the the women of Three Mile Island, the people that actually lived through that nuclear accident and how they helped their their families and what's happened to them uh, in terms of health and of this accident, which we know the the radiation releases with Three Mile Island were under underestimated by a factor of something like a hundred or a or thousand. We don't know. It's somewhere in there. And uh, unfortunately, so the health effects were much more serious than the government was willing to admit. But these are the people that lived through those health effects, so they know firsthand what that was. So she's making a movie about that. And uh, <laughs> she was on our show for A Green Future, and she has started a podcast, and the name of her podcast is A Green Future. <laughs> it's going to run from July 14th to August 4th, and uh, I, I just have to say that I'm I'm sincerely flattered. <laughs> the, the old saying is, uh, "Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery," and so, <laughs> so thank you, Heidi, for the for the for being flattering and. After having been a guest on For a Green Future, starting a part podcast called A Green Future. And we all need to get to A Green Future. We should all be working on creating that, that green future. And an important thing to remember, though, uh, you know, I, I talk about the Trump administration because it is so horrible. <clears throat> but I, I also have to be realistic about the, the Democrats and they're in a potential Biden administration. I had a Facebook memory thrown up to me yesterday and it, it had to do way back with the BP oil spill disaster and what happened after that, uh, the Obama administration fined BP $20 billion for that uh, environmental disaster, the, the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And you you think oh of course Obama pro environment but you but you forget that Obama during the oil spill <clears throat> actually went and walked hand in hand with the CEO of BP on the beaches uh, where the oil was starting to wash up and so he sh he showed his support personally in that situation and he was kind of during the whole crisis he was sort of a spokesman for BP he would take the news they were giving and just read it out to the country but you're saying oh but then there's this 20 billion dollar fine but in that same year 
the Obama administration gave BP $30 billion in incentives to drill for more oil in the Gulf of Mexico. So just because, just defeating Trump, just getting Trump out of office, isn't necessarily going to fix all these problems. The Biden administration might not restore the perchlorate ban. You know, we cannot just assume switching political parties is going to help um, by itself because so many times both political parties, we just saw that this past week with House Bill 104, where both Republicans and Democrats voted to create this uh, authority that's going to br- that wants to bring uh, nuclear waste and new nuclear power plants to Ohio, just switching the party may not, is not enough. Is definitely not enough. We all of us of any party, all of us that are humans, need to keep advocating for a better environment, regardless of who's in authority, regardless of who has the offices and who's in power, because in the end, what matters is what gets done to help the environment. It doesn't matter who gets credit for it. It doesn't matter um, which party is in power. If the Republicans were protecting the environment, you know, we would not have to be fighting them tooth and nail. But instead, they're not. They're they're hell bent on going in the other direction. So, so. That's all I'm saying is, is, and I have to, now full disclosure, of course, I have to say this. I am the political director of the Ohio Green Party, so now you know where I'm coming from. But on this show, I don't speak for the Green Party. I am speaking only for myself, as is true of all my guests, and as is true of Rebecca and anyone who calls in. You'd be welcome to call to, in too. I, I still have time for one really quick story, 856. So, We've got about three minutes left to talk, and I just want to express my gratitude to those of you who listen. I know there's a lot of you out there, even though a lot, not a lot of people call in, because I often get stopped by people who, you know, once they knew my, who I am, they're like, oh, yes, I listen to your show. And I, I really, really appreciate that, because this knowledge, you know, the 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 knowledge I've amassed about environmental issues and ecology, any kind of knowledge, is of no use unless it is shared. We all need to be sharing with each other useful knowledge about the world and about how things work. And I, I'm just so grateful that I have that opportunity every single week here on For a Green Future. And it, it would be great if you could help me to continue to share by becoming a patron by going to patreon.com. But I I also know that my wife appreciates it because (laughs) without this show, basically I'm I'm harassing her all the time (laughs) with all this information because, uh, you know, we're human beings. We're social creatures. And unless we share our knowledge, unless we share what we're doing and what we're thinking with each other, it in a way it doesn't count. I mean, you can have the perfect idea for the future but if you don't share that with anybody and it just dies with you it didn't mean anything it's it's not uh, it's not important in a way it's a waste so don't waste your future don't waste our future do what you can to help us bring about the green future you know buy that hybrid electric car put up those solar panels and encourage your, your friends and neighbors to do the same. You know, share with them the fact that we've got to stop putting carbon in the air. You know, everybody kind of knows this. Everybody, this this message has sunk in. The polls are all showing 70 to 80 percent of Americans realize that we have to stop putting so much carbon in the air. And yet people are still going out and buying the pickup trucks that get eight miles per gallon. I, I see more and more hybrids on the car and electric cars on the road, but it's still the minority. It's still this tiny percentage. It's, it's kind of like plastics. You know, only 10% of plastics get recycled. We need 100% to be either recycled or not generated in the first place. So we're, we are shifting, but folks, we've got to pick up the pace. And so, you know, I'm very glad to be able to come on here and 
Thank you very much. This is Joe Damar signing off. And I do believe it's time we was done. No,